Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 128 of the podcast. My name is Rick Deweese. I'll be your host this week. Okay, we've got a couple of emails, one from Joey and one from Paul. We'll talk about a couple of shaves of the day, both Thursday and Friday. A, a hike into history, followed by the Sunday shave of the day. And uh, great marketing, if it's true. <laughs> I ran into something that just kind of struck me. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> couple more shaves of the day. I finally get around to fixing my broken brushes. So that's my fine brush with a synthetic knot and my Samog 1305, which is one of my favorite bore brushes. Uh, the other bore brushes that I have is my Samog 830, which has exactly the same knot as the 1305, just has the acrylic handle. And uh, personally, I prefer the wooden handle. Ever since I got it, that's been my go-to brush, uh, more so than the acrylic handle. It just fits better. And uh, then I also have the uh, the Samog Owner's Club brush, which is a, a big monster of a brush. Um, compared to the 1305, probably half again as big as the, as the 1305. And uh, great knot in that one as well. But uh, the 1305 and the, uh, and the fine... Uh, synthetic, both uh, kind of fell down on the job, as it were, although I have put them, I mean, they were, uh, at least the Samog, anyhow, was used quite frequently, uh, and like I said, it's about my daily driver, so I finally got around to fixing them, talk about that, Wednesday shave of the day, and then finally, don't go meekly into the night, well, that's the show this week, let's get on with this thing. So I got an email update from Joey for Shea Moisturizer Shea Butter Shave Soap Review update. So I have tried the Shea Moisture Shea Butter Shave Soap for shaving. I experienced what others have experienced as well, lack of lather lubrication. The lather doesn't last long enough. I even tried adding glycerin. No luck. It is definitely great as a body soap. It rinses clean. Enough lather to feel clean after a shower. I'll continue to use it as a body soap. Shave on, Joey. <laughs> well, good to know. I'll, uh, I won't bother trying it then. <laughs> so I also got an email from Paul. He says, good afternoon, Rick. My name is Paul, and I live in Bracebridge, Ontario, Canada. I'm new to your blog and enjoy it very much. Keep up the great work for sure. I am contacting you with some questions. I've been a wet shaver for most of my shaving years. I'm now 55. For years, I used a cartridge systems and then found Harry's online and switched to them. At that time, I thought this was great. A great close shave at half the cost. But still not totally satisfied, so I went looking to see what others are doing, and I came across you. I've enclosed a picture to show you what I now have. The razor on the right of the picture is a new razor, which is a Mercure 33C, and with it I purchased the blades, well, except for the Gillettes. The razor on the left is one that my dad left me along with the Gillette blades. It was really dirty and kind of green and worn, but I was able to clean and polish the razor to an almost like new condition. I'm a goldsmith by trade, so cleaning up the razor was easily done. I have had four shaves. The first one with the Mercure and the Astro Blade. The second one with the Mercure and a Feather Blade. The third with the Gillette Razor and a Gillette Blade. And the last one with the Mercure with the Feather Blade. Of any of the Mercure with the, uh, of any, the Mercure with the Feather was the closest and nicest to shave with, but I was nowhere near satisfied with single blade, uh, you know, double-edged shaving. I can't get BBS shave at all. I'm doing up to four passes, and I can still feel stubble, also getting irritation on my neck, which I've not had for years. To me, this is making the hairy system look pretty darn good. I've watched many videos and read many forums and blogs and understand it may take up to a month for me to get adjusted to this style of shaving. I'm also of the opinion that I may have to retrain my beard to make it more satisfactory for shaving. My beard now grows in all directions. I've also wondered about using Paraso uh, Sensitive Pre-Shave along with Paraso Soap. Also wondered about Taylor Bold Bond Street uh, German Soap and what uh, about a Mercure Progress adjustable razor as well. I currently use a soap that I came across here from a soap shop that has all natural ingredients, which my skin really likes. 
I also tried William soap, and my neck did not like that at all. Broke out in a bad rash after shaving. I have very sensitive skin with a coarse pig bristle-like beard. What a great combination, eh? Not. <laughs> I'm also a raw food vegan, so my diet is pretty clean. Drink up to two liters of water per day, and I'm also confident that uh, your skin will determine what is going on inside you. Not sure if this is a factor with my skin condition or not, but when I pay attention to what and how I eat, it makes a real difference for me. Don't feel like you have to read this on your blog. This is quite lengthy, but if you could reply with your thoughts, that would be great. Thank you and take care, Paul. Okay, Paul, you got a lot of questions in there. First off, you've only had four shaves, um, so uh, keep up the good work. Now, the... Uh, the the razors that you have, you have the Mercure uh, 33C, and the Gillette that you have is a 1940s Gillette Super Speed, um, which is a twist to open, and you can tell it's a Super Speed by the uh, twist to open part on the bottom has the two bands across it, and it's just it is a uh, 1940s Super Speed. Okay, so out of all of the blades that you have, um, as I look at these things, you've got a Feather Astra. Uh, what looks to be some, I don't know what those are. I don't know if those are Gillette or Mercures or what. Yeah, those are the Mercures and then the Wilkinsons. Um, the Astras, the Mercures and the Wilkinsons for me, and, and again, please keep in mind, this is for me. For me, those are mid-range blades. Those are not really, really good blades. Um, and so they, that may be part of the problem. I don't know. Uh, the feather blade is in fact a good blade. It's, uh, for me, it's, it's a very sharp blade, but it's also a very smooth blade. Um, the, the combination that I would suggest, quite honestly, is the feather in the Gillette. Now, you've already had good luck with the feather in the Mercure. Try the feather in the Gillette. Okay, now on to some of the other questions. Well, first off, back to the blades. Um, another good way to uh, to get a bunch of blades that you can buy singly uh, just to try them out is go to tryablade.com, and you can get a whole assortment of blades, and uh, that way you can try out different types, different styles. You can learn a little bit about them and uh, see what works best for you in your razors because, again, the blade choice is, uh, you know, the variables there are the razor, your technique, your skin, the soap that you have, and your beard, as well as, well, just about everything else. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, um, yeah, it's, it's almost like a chemistry experiment. It really is. But that's kind of the fun of it all. Okay. So, um, you said that you can't get BBS. Okay. First off, don't try to get B BBS, especially when you first start off. Um, the, the, the lessons that I've learned over the years of, of wet shaving, uh, have basically been don't try to do it all at once and, uh, go gently. Um, because if you start, if you start trying to get BBS, what's going to happen, whether you realize it or not, is you're going to start putting more pressure on the razor, which is going to cause more irritation in your skin. And if you're already having problems with irritation, by instinctively, remember, you've been shaving with a cartridge razor system for a long time, and a cartridge razor system is very forgiving for pressure. In fact, it demands a little bit of pressure to get a really close shave with. And so instinctively, what you're probably trying to do is put pressure into your razor, even if you don't know it, because you're trying to get close, okay, which is potentially causing the irritation that you're having. Okay, so um, four passes is good, although I would probably cut back to three and just go with uh, socially acceptable for a while, especially until you get to a point where, you know, you learn the technique, you, know, you learn the angles, you learn what works for you, okay? Um, the other thing is the, is the soap choice. Okay, uh, let's see if I can find that again here. The, uh, let's see, you had talked about Williams soap and uh, let's see whoa where was that here do 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 nah, I can't find it. anyhow you had talked about Williams soap Williams is not a really great soap um it will you know it's okay but it's not great um you say that you use a soap that you can access from the soap shop with all natural ingredients okay what I would suggest 
is get online and uh, go to uh, go to Maggard's Razors and uh, buy an unscented soap, preferably if you can find one for sensitive skin. A lot of soap makers, a lot of artisans make a uh, a soap that is uh, for sensitive skin. Un- you know, it can be scented or typically typically it's unscented. Um, but what you'll find is the performance of the soap will be far and above better than what Williams can provide. I mean, it, it really will. In fact, I talk about that uh, in this episode with uh, with another soap that I'm uh, doing a review and kind of a test on. Um, soaps do make a big difference. Uh, the the residual glide that you would get out of a, a good artisan soap versus Williams, which is kind of like the soap I'm testing this week, which doesn't have much of a much uh, residual glide at all. And again, that's what ends up happening is if you don't have any residual glide, if you go back over the area, it starts skipping, bouncing, irritation, next cuts. It's just bad juju all the way around. So, you know, you may want to, uh, you may want to, uh, try that. Um, other than that, um, that those would be my suggestions at this point. Try the feather blades for a while. Uh, to me, okay, cause like I said, you've got, You've got Feathers, Astras, Mercures, and Wilkinsons. The Wilkinsons, to me, don't work real well. Uh, the Mercures, for me, have been middle of the road. I mean, they just, they're okay, but some people really, really like all these blades. I, I'm just, I'm just expressing from my experience with them. I've tried the Astra once, and for me, they were nothing special. The Feathers, yeah, the Feathers are good blades. Um, another blade that you might want to try is, uh, you know, some of the Gillettes, especially the Gillettes made in Russia. Uh, those are very good blades. Um, feathers, again, are good. Kai's are good. Crystals made in Israel are really good. Um, so that's, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to wet shaving. You know, it's, it's one of those things. People always joke, yeah, if anybody ever tries to tell you that they've wet shaved for a while and trying to save money, they're kidding you. Well, you can, but yeah, there's some experimentation that needs to occur first to find out what works for you. Um, and like I said, I'd go to try a blade. I'll put a link up in the show notes, but I'd go to try a blade uh, and look at some of the blades there and keep in mind, at least for me, again, just speaking from experience, you get what you pay for when it comes to blades. And uh, I don't know. They may charge a lot for the Mercures, but I've never had really good luck with them. It's again, it's just me. Um, the adjustable uh, razors, like you know, the Mercure Progress, yeah, they're nice, but you really need to learn the techniques and and what you're doing with a, um, if you can, with the razors that you have before you go the route of an adjustable, because uh, an adjustable can either give you the same performance as what you have right now. Um, be more aggressive, but potentially give you more irritation, or be less aggressive and not give you a smooth shave. So it's 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 really a it's a balancing act. Anyhow, Paul, those are my uh, those are my kind of observations. Um, I'd really really be interested if uh, you know you wrote me back at some point and let me know how it's going. Um, and uh, more importantly, uh, welcome to the wet shaving community. And uh, thank you very much for the email. Let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so the shave of the day today was with a Rapira blade. And the problem that I had with the Rapira blade this morning, especially after having a a nice matchup with some really fine blades, is uh, I don't know how many shaves I had on that Rapira blade. It was in a long-handled Gillette adjustable, and uh, I had it on a 5, and it was, well, it shaved well, but it was, in fact, a little rough. So, uh, yeah, it was just one of those things. I was in a bit of a hurry and uh, threw some Cat A soap on my face, basically, and uh, I knew that one had a Rapira blade in it, so I went ahead and uh, and shaved with it. Probably not the wisest thing to do. I probably should have changed blades, but it was one of those things where I was in a hurry and I just grabbed what was there. Um, yeah, so sometimes that happens. 
Now, I did throw on some uh, some Stetson Cooling Splash, which doesn't have a lot of alcohol, has more menthol, and that, you know, there was no sting or anything, and uh, that's been okay. But, I, you know, here I'm, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes after the shave, and there are a few spots where I can tell that things are a little bit, well, abused, I guess is the best word. So uh, it happens. You know, it uh, it happens. But at the same time, you know, I also have to look back at the fact that I just spent a week basically having very fine shaves with blades that were very uh, tender, if you will, um, towards uh, me and my skin. And so uh, perhaps there's a little, uh, I don't know, oversensitivity to, uh, to a tad of blade roughness. I don't know. It's a good theory, anyhow. And... Uh, <laughs> But uh, the shave of the day, well, it went okay. It was fast. It was quick. It was, uh, yeah, it was one of them. It's always one of those things where, you know, the night after, yeah, Thursday mornings are always rough because I'm I'm doing the podcast on, on Wednesday night and getting up in the morning and, uh, and getting a shave. It's like, hmm, it's a little rushed. So it's one of those things where I find, I don't know, I... I, I I discover things when I rush. It's uh, which is not necessarily bad. For example, um, even though I had my Gillette adjustable set at a five, with the repair of blade in it, there were a couple of times when it felt like I was essentially shaving with a straight razor um, at a bit of a high angle. It, uh, you know, I could feel the blade at that level, and it was only set to a 5. It wasn't set to a 7 or anything like that. And uh, I found that, well, disturbing and interesting all at the same time. It was it was just, it was curious. And uh, I don't know if that's, if it's that particular razor or what, but it was, uh, it was just curious. I had not expected and or anticipated that. So I may go back just for, you know, grins and, uh, try the, uh, either the feather or the Kai blade in that thing to see if I get the same feel. Not necessarily shape quality or anything else, but just blade feel. Uh, it'll be interesting, and it may lead me to think, anyhow, that the repair blade might be a little wider, while the uh, Gillette Silver Blue is a little bit narrower, um, that the repair blade might, in fact, be just a touch wider, and therefore give more blade exposure and more blade feel. Don't know. It's a good theory, but uh, I'll have to play around with it and find out. Uh, first off, before we talk about anything else, let me make a blanket statement. If you're driving a car and there are 10 or more cars behind you packed up very, very tightly, you're probably going too slow. Just saying. Ugh. Anyhow, let's talk about the shave of the day. <laughs> Okay, so the the shave of the day today, I, I used something that was just a little bit different. I used a different soap today. I had wanted to try this soap out for a while, and uh, so I finally got around to doing it. What I did was I bought a puck, or what I thought was a puck, of the Vanderhagen Scented Luxury Shave Soap. Yeah. I bought it up at Walmart, it wasn't too expensive, and I wanted to try it out. What I found when I opened the box was, in fact, not a puck of soap, but rather a container of soap, a small plastic container. Um, so, you know, it's it's got the right amount of soap in it and everything, but I was, in looking at the picture on the box, I had assumed that it would be a puck of soap with kind of a rounded top looking thing. Turned out it wasn't that way at all. Anyhow, so opening the container up, you get a, a very light lemon soap scent. It is it is extremely light. So apparently their their luxury scented is well. Here we'll 
will spritz just a touch of lemon in this thing, and other than that, it'll just smell like soap. <laughs> okay, it doesn't smell bad. Don't don't uh, don't misunderstand. It's just. Uh, you know, I would have assumed that if you are going to sell a scented soap, it would be scented with more than just a wisp and a prayer. <laughs> Anyhow, the uh, again, it's not expensive soap. Uh, I believe it's a glycerin-based soap, but I haven't looked at the package. This was just the first. I mean, I grabbed the box, opened it up, flipped the lid, took a sniff, and then proceeded to load the brush. Now, now the, the brush that I used was a uh, was my uh, badger brush and uh i went ahead and soaked it and 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 loaded this thing now what i found was that because of the container size because it was a small container and uh, the soap comes just about all the way up to the edge that uh, what i ran into was soap going well essentially everywhere and it was just a little bit difficult to uh to load but all is good. We managed to get the job done and uh, proceeded to lather things up in ye old salsa bowl. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty decent lather. Put a little bit of water in it, one teaspoon, but that was about it. And uh, it was it was okay. So lathered up. Um, now, I, I understand on these soaps, you know, it probably, more than likely, the top layer, the first go, if you will, is, Probably not indicative of uh, of the shaves further on down, but th that's what I'm hoping, uh, suspecting anyhow, because the the soap was well just a tad thin, and I'll put that on two fronts. First off, it was again I had a little bit of difficulty loading it; is a little bit harder than I thought it uh, should be, and uh, and then at the same time is just the quality of the soap itself, um, in my estimation. So went ahead and uh, and shaved. Now I shaved with a uh, a straight razor today, and uh, the the it, let's see if I can get the uh, the picture of it here. The uh, it is a silver steel Sheffield straight razor. It is either a it, I'm I'm pretty sure it's a semi wedge. It might be a full wedge, but uh, it's I I'm thinking it's a semi wedge. It's but doggone, it's heavy, it's thick, it's a, a Joseph and Sons, I believe it is, but uh, I'll have to check. I, I'm driving right now in the mobile studio, and trying to look at a picture at, while driving is probably not a good idea. Anyhow, <laughs> it is a Sheffield razor, and uh, it is a wedge-type razor, and it is thick and heavy, and uh, it feels good moving it around. I mean, I enjoy the weight and heft of the thing. Um, it does need a little touch-up on the blade. Uh, I'm going to probably do that this weekend if I get an opportunity to uh, just uh, throw it on the stones and, uh, you know, sharpen it up just a touch more. And uh, all in all, it worked okay. Socially acceptable shave. I'm not going to say I have a BBS shave. It is a socially acceptable shave. Um, so, you know, no real problems there. But one thing that I noticed is that the Vanderhagen soap has absolutely no residual glide. I mean, none. <laughs> it's like once you get that, you know, once you scrape it off, it's gone. It's uh, so, okay, fair enough. As long as you know that about the soap, you can uh, you know you can work with it. But uh, you know up front there is no residual glide, so no touch up passes without first uh, throwing a little bit more of the lather on there. That's just uh, kind of the way it is. Otherwise, you're going to have skipping, and you know on a safety razor you're going to have skipping and cutting and nicking and bumping and just yeah it's going to be it's going to be bad. Uh, anyhow. So, all in all, it, it wasn't a bad shave. It was uh, something that I had wanted to play with for a while, so I did learn a little bit, so that's a good thing. And, uh, as always, I enjoy playing around with my straight razors, well, because they're, you know, metal things with edges on them. Well, you know, we, we like that kind of thing. <laughs> Anyhow, it is Friday. I'm looking forward to the day. Finally, the, uh, the the person that was driving so slowly at the lead of about 10 cars 
uh, pulled off. I don't know if they didn't know where they were going or were looking for a road or what, but it's like, you know, when you're on a road that is typically not busy or not terribly busy, um, and you have 10 cars packed up behind you, yeah, there's a problem with the guy up front. <laughs> Holy cow. It's, uh, it is amazing. It's, you know, and, and I wonder often, oftentimes if, if they look in the rear view mirror or do they not because, well, it's all about them. I don't know. It's just, you know, as a frustrated driver here in the back, <laughs> I often wonder about that, that about the, uh, the, the people that are driving, well, in the front. <laughs> uh, I wonder if NASCAR drivers feel like that. <laughs> Ah, he won't pull over. It's all about him. <laughs> Anyhow, that's the shave of the day. So I went on a hike with my Boy Scouts yesterday with my troop, and the hike that I went on was uh, up to King's Mountain. Now, if you've never uh, heard about King's Mountain... Kings Mountain was uh, one of the pivotal, uh, pivotal, not pivotal. <laughs> Jeez. So Kings Mountain was one of the pivotal um, battles in the Revolutionary War, where the over the mountain men, otherwise known as the Scotch Irish clans, basically in the uh, in the hills of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee got rather uh, upset with, with the uh, British military and the threats that the British military were uh, were issuing and decided to uh, to join the battle now the british had basically gone down to uh, to south carolina because they thought that they would find a bunch of uh, sympathizers otherwise known as tories and they figured that if they uh, if they fought the battle and the tories came in it would be over quickly and essentially the uh, the British royalty would own the South. However, they made a mistake, and that mistake is is that they essentially threatened the Over the Mountain. And now remember, these are Scotch-Irish uh, folk who live back in the back country, and uh, they live back there with essentially no support and a lot of Indians. And uh, so they end up coming from a very, a very uh, battle-hardy environment in Ireland and Scotland, and they jump into the fray in a battle-hardy environment with the Indians and back in the backwoods, and the British royalty decides to, well, threaten them. Bad move. Anyhow, the uh, the over-the-mountain men basically surrounded uh, Colonel Ferguson and his troops that had, I believe it was one-third of the British military supplies in the in the United States at the time, and uh, Ferguson and his men happened to uh, go over to King's Mountain to think, well, okay, it's a it's a high mountain. We'll be able to defend ourselves here for quite some time. <laughs> Another bad mistake. the uh, The British at the time were used to essentially fighting in open fields and on relatively flat terrain, whereas these Scotch Irish and and you know backwoodsmen had basically been uh, trained in the last however many years that they had been there to fight uh, against Indians and, and things like that from behind trees, from ambush, from, well, you know, the kind of fighting that we would normally associate with uh, backwoods. And so they basically surrounded the British on all sides of the mountain, charged up the mountain, and essentially uh, killed a good bunch of them and captured the rest. Ferguson was shot and died uh, on the mountain. They say he was hit seven times. And, uh, yeah, all in all, it was a great piece of history. Great thing to share with Boy Scout Troop. An enjoyable hike. So we went up there, and uh, we hiked uh, just on a, on a trail that was coming up to, uh, to Kings Mountain, to the National Park area. Uh, hiked about two miles in and then two miles back. So there's four miles there. And then the hike around the uh, the King's Mountain itself, the uh, the National Park, to see all the monuments and to see the uh, the placards uh, describing the the battle and and what went on, uh, that was another hour and a half. So about six and a half miles, and all in all, it was good. Now it was interesting because 
I have a tendency to walk on hikes rather slowly. My wife went with me, and uh, or went with us, and she commented on that. She said, why are you always so slow and always in the back? I said, well, there's there's two reasons for that. Number one, it's a comfortable pace for me. Number two, I want to make sure that none of my scouts, especially the ones at a younger age, feel like they have to run or go faster to keep up. If they can't keep up, they can drop back and they can talk to me and we'll just mosey on down the trail at a slow pace and everybody else will just have to deal with it. So there's actually two reasons that I do that. But it was interesting watching her because she had a lot of, of uh, I don't know, motivation to, to stay with the rest of the group. So uh, I found that interesting. And uh, the other thing is that we had, just to give you an idea, we had five boys and five adults. So there was no uh, no lack of leadership, and no, we didn't lose anybody. <laughs> that doesn't happen with us. Uh, hopefully, we'll never experience that. And uh, yeah, so it was just a, it was an interesting hike. I uh, I wore my uh, my boots, uh, my leather boots, and they uh, they do fine on a hike like that. Although just after six and a half miles of walking on anything, your feet get tired. Uh, but we broke it up with a, uh, we saw a, a movie on the uh, on the battle itself uh, after the four-mile hike, and that was a pretty good rest and put us in pretty good shape for uh, for the next one-and-a-half-mile hike. But all in all, a, a, great, uh, a great time, and uh, again, really enjoyed the history, and all the boys enjoyed the history, which I think was the most important part. Alrighty, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so the shave of the day today was again with the Vanderhagen uh, Scented Luxury Shave Soap. And uh, I'm using a, a new blade, and the blade that I'm using is the Treat New Steel Blade. And i uh, been using that for the last couple of days. The first shave on it was was okay. It was actually fairly smooth. Um, and I didn't have any issues with it. Now today, just because it, uh, I had some time and I could luxuriate in the shave, as it were, I went ahead and used my Case uh, straight razor and uh, touched up with the Treat New Steel Blade in a, uh, in a fat-handled tech and lathered up the, uh, the, the shaving soap in a salsa bowl and went to town. Really, really nice shave. I'm not disappointed at it at all. Um, the treat, of course, is uh, an inexpensive blade, and uh, you know it's uh, it's not a super high dollar blade, but it does a very reasonable job. So uh, you know sometimes you have to make that trade off, um, and it's not a bad thing if, uh, say, for example, you don't shave very often, or you don't mind swapping blades out every now and then. Um, you know something like this could really be an alternative. So. Uh, not a bad thing at all. So I'm still playing around with the Treat uh, New Steel Blade, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, the shave of the day today, anyhow, was very, very nice. So how about this for a marketing scheme? <laughs> Prior to the hike on Saturday, I went to the, uh, to the gas station to the Quickie Mart, if you will, to get a cup of coffee. Poured the coffee in a styrofoam cup, paid for it, and came on back out to the car. Well, the truck, actually, the mobile studio. My wife, who was going with us on the, uh, on the hike, was in the mobile studio. And when I walked in and I set my coffee down in the cup holder, got in, started the truck, I hadn't gone about five feet when she said, that coffee smells like bacon. How can coffee smell like bacon? And I thought to myself, okay, it doesn't smell like bacon to me, but it obviously does to her, and hmm, I wonder if, and this is just the way my mind works, but the first thing that came to mind was, I wonder if it's a marketing ploy, if they intentionally put esters in coffee just to make it smell like bacon so that people buy it. 
Because the majority of people that buy bacon in, say, a gas station are guys. Guys appreciate the smell of bacon. I wonder if they do that. Now, granted, that is rather cynical of me, but if they do, man, what a marketing trick, huh? Bet you never thought of that one. Making coffee smell like bacon. And if they can sprinkle a little ester of egg in there, too, wow, then you got the combination. You got bacon, eggs, and coffee. That's what dreams are made of right there. Anyhow, it was just a curiosity, and, and you start to wonder, okay, if they're if they get to the point where they put bacon smell in coffee just to smell, sell more of it, what else and what other smells do they put in things that we don't even recognize? Because before she said that, I had never even thought of what that coffee smelled like. I just knew that it smelled good. But I didn't relate any bacony type smell to that coffee actually smelling good. I just, in my head, it was just, well, it smells good. Very curious. It's one of those things that makes you say, hmm, wonder what else is out there, and I wonder what other uh, <laughs> adventures they have in store for us. Something to make you think, anyhow. Let's talk about the shave of the day. So I continue my fun, my experiments, my playing with the Vander Hagen uh, soap, the Vander Hagen scented luxury soap. And uh, the reason that I'm doing that, there, there's a couple of reasons. First off, you can find it everywhere. And what I thought of when I first found it or saw it was that, okay, this is something that you can find at Walgreens, at Walmart, at the grocery store. You can find this stuff everywhere. And for those that are getting into wet shaving that have never done this before, I would probably bet that until they find that websites exist or, you know, things like that, until they find out, in order to just experiment with it and to determine whether it's something that, well, they want to do, um, what they would probably do is go to a Walmart and pick up a soap, grab a brush, uh, probably one of the Vander Hagen brushes as well, and uh, proceed to use that. And so for a lot of instances, this soap would be the first, well, experience, if you will, exposure to wet shaving. Now, the uh, the Vander Hagen soap is, in fact, a glycerin-based soap. It's got about 10% glycerin, and it's got shea butters and cocoa butters and things like that. And supposedly it's supposed to provide good glide and everything else and good cushion. And <clears throat> quite honestly, it's not a it's not a terrible soap. It's not a miserable soap. So don't uh, don't think that I'm saying that it's that it's bad. But it's not real good from a glide perspective. I mean, you know, it's okay once the soap is there, but once you shave the soap off, it's uh, yeah, it's gone. Uh, there, There is no glide after that. There's no residual glide. It does leave a very clean, you know, soapy feel or soap feel, I guess. Um, you know, in fact, they even put on the thing that you can use it as a bar soap. Okay. Um, don't know if I want to be shaving with a bar soap. I'm just saying. So anyhow, it's, uh, I mean, the other thing that annoys me uh, just in general about the thing, and, and maybe it's because I'm, maybe it's just because I'm spoiled, but uh, it comes in a small plastic container, and the soap fills that plastic container pretty much all the way up to the rim, or at least just shy of the rim. And uh, it makes loading the brush and, and working with the soap just, well, messy. It really does. It just makes it messy. You know, my uh, I, be, I used my Samog Owners Club brush this morning, and uh, that brush, with just a slight splay, fills out, well, the whole container of soap. The whole thing. So as soon as you start loading and moving the brush around, you're going outside and over top of the container and just putting soap everywhere. So it becomes a messy proposition. And, and 
you know, when I when I look at okay, yeah, you've got you've got a a reasonable soap. We'll, we'll call it a reasonable soap, um, but it's messy and the glide isn't great. You know, if you if you compare it, for example, to the can of goo, okay, the can of goo has well, there's a little bit of residual glide in the majority of the cans of goo, like the gel products and stuff, and you don't necessarily get that with this. So in making the transition, I'm sitting there thinking in my head that in making the transition, a, a shaver would be going from a can of goo, a, you know, a gel type or a foam type, to this stuff. All right, it's a little bit more work. It's a little bit more preparation that, you know, that they're not used to. And it doesn't have the residual glide. It takes a little bit more work to, to create the lather. And it's supposed to be better, and at least in the residual glide category, it's not. Hmm. Vander Hagen is not doing us any favor in getting converts, in my opinion. So, anyhow, when I compare it to some of the other soaps that I have used that are also inexpensive soaps, Arco, for example, you know, or uh, or uh, Chella, or, you know, something like that. I mean, uh, just be wonderful soaps. And they've got a good bit of residual glide. They've just, you know, it's they're better soaps for shaving. So it's just a curiosity. It was one of those things that I was just, you know, I thought it was maybe loading. And so I tried to load the brush a little bit better. I tried blooming. I tried, you know, I've tried every trick that I know, know to use. Um, and it just doesn't really get any better. It's like what you see is what you get. It's it's you can't plateau this stuff. It's, or you can't uh, you know you can't get it any better. It's just that yeah, it is. So yeah, I look at something like Katie's Bubbles, which is a, a phenomenal soap, and and it's so much better than this stuff that you know if it was up to me, if I could replace all these Vanderhagen boxes with Katie Bubbles boxes, uh, you know, or even uh, Phoenix. You know, I mean, you know, Phoenix makes great soaps as well. You know, it's just we're not doing ourselves any favor by putting putting a product out like like this Vanderhagen soap and, you know, having that be the gateway, if you will, to wet shaving. Anyhow, so on the other side of the shaving experience, after lathering up with the uh, Vanderhagen and Smog Owners Club brush, I, I went ahead and shaved it off with the Treat New Steel Blade. Made in Pakistan, and uh, oh yeah, over at Tri Blade, they're they're twenty cents a blade. So for twenty cents a blade, okay, this is the third shave on it, or thereabouts, and yeah, it's uh, it's socially acceptable. I did a three pass shave with some touch ups, and it's socially acceptable. So I'm thinking a twenty cent blade is getting maybe three days, maybe. Uh, maybe, maybe a stretch. There's no, uh, there's no issues or anything. I mean, it wasn't a rough shave or anything like that. It was a very smooth shave. Um, but it's like it gave its all and it just couldn't do any more. <laughs> you know, and the problem is, is that I come off of that and I, you know, go to a, an 80 or 90 cent blade like the Kai and it's like, oh, it's just worlds of difference. You know, the Kai, I, I don't, you probably leave that thing in a week and a half and not really care. And uh, this thing is like three days, and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, because I mean, I put a little pressure on this thing, and 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 went over areas against the grain in certain spots, and and it's just, it's socially acceptable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's done. So twenty cent blade, it's it's really amazing, you know. I've I've, you don't. There are some instances where you truly don't get what you pay for in, in a, uh, you know, a, a, an item that doesn't cost a whole lot performs just as well as an item that costs a bunch. You know, a good example in the area of razors themselves is the little Lord Tech that's like 10 bucks on Amazon shaves just as good as uh, some more expensive razors, but it only costs 10 bucks. On the other hand, so far, my experience with blades is that you get what you pay for. That's just been my experience. Now, of course, there's also the thing that you have to uh, validate, I guess, what to, what works well for you in your conditions, water, soaps, you know, razors, style, etc. But 
you get what you pay for, at least for me, because I really find that, uh, you know, blades that are down in the 15 and 20 cent a piece range, eh, they struggle. They struggle, uh, especially after a couple of days. But uh, the ones that are higher priced, yeah, they're they're much better blades, and uh, they act accordingly. Anyhow, finish it off with a little bit of uh, Avon Spice, some classic Avon Spice, and uh, off to the off to the donut factory I go. Okay, so let's talk about the shave of the day. All right, the shave of the day was actually not the shave of the day. It was, in fact, the shave of the night. So after having re-glued with Gorilla Glue epoxy the synthetic knot into the fine handle, I once again had a fine brush and uh, that I could use. And uh, so last night I came home, and because my... My blade in the, uh, my, my treat a new steel blade had, I surmised, pretty much bit the dust. I went ahead and tried it. Just, okay, is, was it me? Was I rushed? Was it, uh, was it something that I was doing? So I, I lathered up with the fine brush, the, uh, the Vanderhagen, uh, Vanderhagen soap. Proceeded to, uh, face lather, let it sit there a while and moisturize everything nicely and, you know, uh, lathering it in and all, and uh, proceeded to uh, do some uh, a couple of passes with the Treat New Steel Blade. And in between and afterwards, I went ahead and rinsed off, and what I basically felt was virtually no difference than when I started. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't much. Yes, it might have taken some off, but it wasn't much. It wasn't close. It wasn't good. It wasn't much. Okay, that blade is dead. So, looking upon the uh, the razors in the rack, what has a blade in it? Well, the only one that was easily discernible with a blade was the uh, was my Autostrop. I believe it was the uh, the VC2 with uh with a feather spineless blade in it and uh, so i proceeded to uh complete the shave with a feather spineless blade wonderful shave bbs was in fact achieved and uh, so much so that uh, as i woke up this morning i took a shower felt my face and realized i really didn't need to shave today or at least this morning so all is good with the world. A, a great shave was had by all. So the uh, the treat new steel for twenty cents is uh, worthy of about three shaves, and then it's pretty much kaput. And uh, there you go. So uh, we'll continue trying other blades, uh, perhaps in the treat line, just because it's intriguing. I, I do enjoy their carbon steel blade. It, it's a smooth blade, uh, but uh, this was the treat new steel blade. So uh, all in all, good stuff. The uh, the fine brush with the Vanderhagen soap um, did a very very nice job. Now the for those that don't know, the the fine shaving brush is a is a synthetic knot, uh, reminiscent of the Plisson. It's a little bit smaller. Uh, it it has a little bit smaller footprint, if you will, than the uh, <clears throat> than the uh, Plisson, but it is still a synthetic and does a very very nice job. Of uh, of both loading and uh, and spreading, you know the the lather and as in all synthetic brushes that I have anyhow, they are luxuriously soft. So uh, all in all, good stuff. So didn't shave today or at least this morning. Shaved last night. Uh, it seems to be holding well, socially acceptable. Uh, about the uh, to be quite honest, and this is the thing that's rather amazing. To be quite honest, the shave that I did last night with the Autostrop has me walking out the door this morning with about the same level of shave as I walked out yesterday with after shaving with the Treat New Steel. So, socially acceptable. Yeah, um, it's intriguing. Anyhow, that was the shave of the day.
Well, I got around to cleaning up and fixing my brushes. Now, for those of you that don't know, I had two brushes that had, well, I'm not going to say failed, but at least uh, uh, struggled in the completion of their tasks in that the knot had fallen off of the handle, or out of the handle, as it were. And those two razors were my fine synthetic, as well as my 1305 Samog. Now, when my 1305 Samog went, I was distraught. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Anyhow, because uh, it was my daily driver go-to brush that I just, yeah, I love that brush. Anyhow, the uh, the 1305 was was a bit of a of a surprise, and it was a bit of an issue, and uh, yeah. So I posted that one up on the up on the web, and and a lot of people came back and said, "I'll oh, just buy another one." It's like, well, yeah, I could, but you know, part of this is to at least demonstrate, show, try, uh, you know, and show a little bit of self sufficiency, and you know, don't just go out and buy. Uh, I don't know. That's just kind of a philosophy for me. You know, it's got a perfectly good handle, perfectly good knot. Now, one, one person said, yeah, you need to put a different handle on that one. And it's like, okay, I happen to really, really like the 1305 handle. In fact, I've got an 830, which is the same knot in an acrylic, uh, in an acrylic handle. And when I bought the 1305, knowing it was the same knot, I did so specifically to try out the handle. I don't think I've used my 830 in probably six or eight months. Or if I have, it's just been traveling or something like that. Um, it's not my daily driver. Now, it was for a while because I love that knot. I just didn't appreciate the handle. So, uh, yeah. So, anyhow, back to the repair of the, uh, of the brushes. <clears throat> so, anyhow, when I posted it, uh, a lot of people said, oh, yeah, marine epoxy and Gorilla Glue and, and things like that. Okay, so me being a... a maybe not too intelligent, when I see marine epoxy, now epoxy in and of itself, I understand, you can get it at Lowe's. When they say marine epoxy, I struggle, because it's like, okay, what is that? Uh, just Maybe it's just me, I don't know. However, the Gorilla Glue epoxy is in fact waterproof, and states so on the packaging, at which point I said, okay, if it's waterproof, I'm getting it. Okay, so I got the uh, I got the epoxy, and I'm thinking I'm pretty well set, good to go. And I sit down, and I happen to have my Dremel tool with a small uh, burr bit in it. And uh, I say, okay, let's clean this stuff up and uh, go to town. So what I end up doing is uh, go out on the back porch, and I took a bunch of pictures. I'll post them up on the in the show notes and up on the blog. So if you want to see the actual process. Go to uh, brush and soap and blade dot word blah, blah, brush and soap and blade dot wordpress dot com and uh, take a look at the uh, at the pictures and uh, you'll see what I did. Anyhow, took the uh, took the took the burr bit and uh, I started on the fine brush initially. Now, the when I looked at the fine brush, there was just it, it almost looked like hot glue. It's uh, it didn't look like epoxy. Like I said, it almost looked like 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 hot glue, and it milled out very very quickly. Now it was a plastic of some type, um, so it might have been a, a foamed epoxy or something like that. But it it burred out very very quick. Uh, so I cleaned that up very nicely, and then what I did is I took the uh, the bottom of the knot and I took my my burr bit at a forty five degree angle and actually cut um, marks or traces in the bottom of it just to give the epoxy something to kind of hang on to, give it a little bit more surface area, and give it something to, to catch hold of. So uh, I did that. I then proceeded to uh, to do the, the smog. Now, the thing is, is that when the soap or when the glue let go uh, in the brush, it uh, it let go in a fashion that I could not put the put the knot back in the brush in any way, shape, or form close to its original depth. 
or original positioning. Uh, you know, sometimes when things break, you can position them so everything lines up and it falls back into place. I could not do that with the Samog. Okay, fine. So I proceeded to uh, take the uh, the burr bit and the Dremel tool and uh, get the old glue out of there and clean everything up as best I could. And uh didn't take too long. I made a bit of a mess all over the place because the, the glue that's in there is very... Uh, it cut very easily, and it was like plastic. Uh, so, you know, no problems there. I mean, it was just, you know, I don't want to say you had to be careful. And, in fact, you don't really have to be careful on the Samog because it's got a it's got a metal rim. Uh, I, th- I believe it's aluminum um, that goes down into the, into the handle a bit. So uh, not a big issue there. You know, you don't have to be terribly, terribly careful. It... Uh, it's got that protective metal edging, so uh, you can kind of fix them fairly easily. So drilled that out, or uh, burred it out with the uh, with the burr bit on the Dremel tool, and then proceeded to mix up the epoxy, put some epoxy in the handle, put some epoxy on the uh, on the knot itself, and what I had done just to make sure things were more or less in alignment is I had taken some. Uh, some index cards, some blank index cards, and roll them up into a tube that the handle fit perfectly in, and uh, that way the brush would sit down in there and be centered in the handle, and then just put a little pressure on the uh, on the on the knot to uh, make sure everything's set. Wait a little bit; it's five minutes uh, set time on this stuff, and then uh, proceeded to uh, pull the cardboard tube off and and let things or not cardboard note card. Uh, tube off and uh, let things set for a little bit and then I came back and checked my handiwork and when I checked my handiwork one of the brushes lo and behold fell apart it uh, didn't have enough epoxy to fill the void and so it uh, it popped loose so mixed up some more epoxy put it all back together and uh, did it again Checked them this morning. Yeah, they're in good shape. They're uh, solidly held in place. No problems. No issues. So um, I believe that my brushes are back in action one more time. So uh, I'm looking forward to using those again. And I uh, haven't used the, uh, the the fine brush in a while, so that'll be nice. Um, I'm thinking that the, uh, the epoxy that I used after I cleaned everything up, it might set that thing in just a little bit further into the handle. Give it just a touch more backbone, although I probably won't be able to tell a difference because it has been a while since I used them. But the good note and the, the, the key to all this is that fixing brushes is not something that you should shy away from. Uh, it's something that you could have probably done with a sharp pen knife uh, to uh, clean out the old uh, old epoxy and uh, and... You know, make room for the new and clean everything up and put grooves in the in the bottom of the uh, bottom of the knot. And uh, you, you could have probably done it with pen knife. Would have taken a whole lot longer, but you could have done it. Um, so anyhow, it's uh, if you have a a brush that uh, has a knot that's uh, popped loose, um, might be the way to go. Give it a try. You might be able to resurrect it, just like I did mine. Well, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so the shave of the day was, well, very, very nice. And it started off very, very nicely because, well, I got to do something that I haven't got to do for a while, which is I lathered up with my Samog 1305 brush. Yes, my 1305 is back in action after... Super after uh, gorilla gluing uh, using gorilla glue epoxy and uh, putting the knot back in the handle, it is back in action and boy is it nice. I do enjoy that brush. So good stuff. It just I mean that just that just started the day off with well I was just happy. <laughs> when you start the day off with a smile on your face, first off because you were you you were able to. Repair and fix something that you enjoy, that you, you know, have a feeling of value in. You know, it's a, it's a great brush. It's been a great brush. And so when it, when it comes apart and you're like, oh my gosh, my great brush is, well, broken. I can't use it. 
and then you're able to repair it and fix it with uh, very little cost and put it back together again. I, that just, I'm sorry, that just makes me happy. It's uh, its a good way to start off the day. Anyhow, so 1305, the, uh, you know, probably the, the last shave for a while with the Vander Hagen Luxury Scented Soap, which really doesn't smell like much. And uh, I, it, I, I went ahead and bloomed it, didn't make any difference, still didn't smell like much. It loaded up okay, made a good lather, uh, you know, no residual slickness at all. It's just, I, but, you know, for what it is, it's okay. However, it does, you know, once again, give kind of short shrift to uh, to the wet shaving community, especially those that are starting off and picking it up off the shelf out of pure curiosity. So, oh well, it is what it is. But, you know, they say it's a glycerin soap. I, okay, maybe, but I got to ask, if it's a glycerin soap, then why isn't there any residual glide whatsoever? You know, there ought to be something. It's just, you know, I've got I've got soaps in my in my shower that have more residual glide than this stuff does. A decent cushion. I mean, you know, when you when you lather up and you know you can create nice thick lathers with it, and it gives a decent cushion. But you know, and the glide is okay where the lather is, but the the residual glide is just absolutely non-existent. So you know, keep that in mind, and and it does again go to uh, go to the fact that if, for example, you're used to using shaving cream and having some uh, some residual glide, you know, for, for the goo in a can, whether that be gel or foam or whatever. If you're used to being able to uh, go over a place multiple times uh, with, a, with a razor, you know, without doing a whole lot other than maybe rinsing off the razor or whatever, if you do that with this stuff, you're going to, it's going to be, well, not good. Uh, so you need to understand fundamentally that before you put razor to face, you need to have a layer of lather down. And uh, every time you put razor to face, if there's no lather, don't do it. So, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody who had shaved and is a younger man and kind of nicked themselves up and and I asked him a little bit about the technique there and and it became very clear that what was happening was that they were putting the shaving cream on at first, and then they were shaving it off, and then they were going back over again and again without reapplying any shaving cream at all or no lather at all. And so if that is something that you do, whether consciously or unconsciously, you can't do it with this soap because it uh, it, it will end up with uh, irritation, razor burn, and just, well, bad juju. <laughs> So don't do that. Um, anyhow, the, uh, the the razor that I used today, I went ahead and used my uh, my auto strop and uh, the feather blade that I had the other day that uh, just to finish out the week. Just and then you know, nice nice shave. It's uh, a little bit better than socially acceptable, uh, you know. But that blade has a bunch of shaves on it at this point. It's probably got a dozen shaves on it. So uh, you know. Good shave, a little bit better than socially acceptable. Uh, I'm very pleased with it, very uh, very nice in, in the fact that there's no irritation or no nicks, no cuts, no no none of that. And uh, didn't put on an aftershave. I wanted to see if there was any residual smell at all to the uh, Vanderhagen. And, of course, there doesn't seem to be, uh, which is consistent with the fact that, well, it doesn't smell like much. So... <laughs> I mean, it's an okay soap. It's, you know, in a pinch, yeah, I'd, I'd use it. You know, it's kind of like Williams. You know, it's it's going to become a classic. It's going to be one of those things that, oh, yeah, you know, you got to at least try it kind of thing. Uh, doesn't cost a whole lot. Doesn't perform great. And, well, there you go. And, uh, yeah, so kind of like Williams. Hmm. Anyhow, that was the shave of the day. So this has been a difficult season for me. It it truly has. <clears throat> the uh, the last couple of months have been well difficult because 
unbeknownst potentially to to uh, you folks out there uh, listening, I am a political junkie. I, I really am. I I really enjoy, you know, uh, the the political scene because it is kind of the human experience, you know, under a microscope, if you will. Um, it's uh, it's just it's curious. And I enjoy seeing the the machinations and the the you know what one person says and then what they do and why and just you know try to understand what is going on and how it's all working behind the scenes to to motivate somebody to well do the things that they do. It's I don't know it's a it's a mental game maybe, but I enjoy it. Anyhow, I was. Uh, I was made aware of an article uh, today, as a matter of fact, where somebody was saying that somebody had an unfair advantage because of X, Y, or Z. And it dawned on me in my response that the reason that they have an unfair advantage is because they were not meek. They went out, thought outside of the box, and displayed a boldness that was uncharacteristic of essentially everybody else, to the point where it was so uncharacteristic that people took notice. Now, you can't blame the person for being uncharacteristically bold for getting attention for their boldness. Because what ends up happening is it's very similar to what I've said on this show many, many times. You have to try, and there are people that I run into that just don't want to even try. And it dawned on me while I was, you know, reacting, I guess, to to this this article, that what I'm really talking about is boldness versus meekness. If you follow the group think, if you follow the the, the mold, if you will, um, you are essentially defining yourself as being relatively meek. Even if you are in a group of bold people, if you are the same, well, you're relatively meek. And the point is, is that meekness doesn't win anything. It doesn't gain anything. Meekness doesn't gain anything on a football field or on a basketball court. Meekness doesn't win anything in a business office. (laughs) Meekness definitely doesn't win any attention on a campaign trail. But it's the concept of meekness or boldness that is important. We should not offhandedly alienate or call bad those that are bold because it was it, it's it's the very boldness that has allowed well the society that we have henry ford for example was a rather bold character when compared to his compatriots and because of that cars are everywhere Thomas Edison was a bit of a bold character who thought outside the box. Yeah. Um, When you look back at history, it's the ones that are bold that win big. Now, at the same time, with any bold action comes risk. And maybe that's the root of it, and that's the reason that we have become, well, to a certain extent, a a tad meek societally, is because we have been trained, essentially, to be risk-averse. We we don't necessarily step up to challenges anymore. We're risk-averse and want somebody else to fix it. It may be the reason that we can't get more people, you know, into the wet shaving society and the wet shaving movement because they're risk averse and they view it as dangerous and bold and, 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 you know, outside the box. Holy cow, you're using a straight razor? You may cut your throat. 
I'm going to use the cartridge razor and be safe. Hmm. So it's it's interesting when you look around at how things were created, how the inventions and the the movements that we have were were generated and created. It was because of boldness. It was because of people taking risks and being willing to either suffer the consequence for that risk or suffer the rewards for that risk. People who are entrepreneurs know this well. There is a risk that you take sometimes when you are, are, for example, an artisan and making a product. If somebody has a negative reaction to it, there is a risk there. There is a risk of somebody not liking your product and dragging your name through the mud while they describe the disdain that they have. And, well, there's a risk there as well. And, well, wouldn't it be more comfortable if you just didn't do anything at all and just went to your job day in and day out and worked for somebody else and kept your head low and stayed out of trouble and weren't noticed? Yeah, it's way less risk, but it's also way less reward. So it's interesting because we've we've come to a point that some people willingly read an article that say that that you know an article that says that well somebody was bold and therefore they had an unfair advantage. I'm sorry but that's life. Again, if you are bold on a battlefield or bold on a football field and you win, Should you be castigated for your boldness? Or should you be applauded because you went ahead, took the calculated risk, and won? Again, it all goes down to try. But you have to be less risk-averse and more open to both risk and reward to take that first step to, to even get to the point where you can try. You can't jump out of the airplane with the parachute to experience both free fall and hanging under a parachute 3,000 feet above the earth. You can't experience that at all until you are willing to take the risk of getting into the plane in the first place. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher.